Um, welcome to today's webinar on um, artificial intelligence in education, hosted by Centre for Progressive Policy. Um, my name's Rosie Fogden and I'm Director of Research and Analysis at CPP and I'm going to chair um, today's discussion, which is going to be about how AI in education could help reduce educational dis dis disadvantage if it's well deployed. Um, and kind of having a bit of a think about what uh, policy structures and systems we need to put in place to ensure that it reduces, not increases inequality. So just a quick kind of recap about what we do at CPP. We're an economics think tank, um, which is committed to a fairer, more inclusive model of growth uh, that reaches people, you know, both across the income spectrum and in places across the country. And our previous work in kind of education and skills has focused on those policies to improve educational attainment and access to good jobs um, in more deprived communities. And, and AI is a new, a new foray for us as an organisation. So today's webinar um, coincides with the paper we've newly published on AI in education, which was written by um, Roger Taylor, who is, joins us for today's discussion. Um, and alongside Roger, we're delighted to welcome Rose Luckin, a professor of uh, Learner Centre Design at UCL and Knowledge Lab and founder and CEO of Educate Ventures Research. Um, William Power, Head of Maths at Oxford University Press. Uh, Dr. Kuroke Pothong, Visiting Fellow at LSE and Ross Moody, who's a Senior Research Analyst here at CPP. Um, so this is going to be you know, quite a pacey webinar. It's only 45 minutes. Um, we'll have 25 minutes of panel discussion uh, and then end with an audience Q&A. And if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function on your screen. And also feel free to tweet about today's event using hashtag AI education at Centre Pro Policy. Um, we're live streaming and recording the webinar and we'll post it on our YouTube. Um, so we've got a great panel and I don't really want to take up too much of your time as I'm definitely not an AI expert. <laughs> so to kick us off, I'm going to hand over to Roger Taylor, who's the author of the paper CPP have just published and is former chair of the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation. He's going to give us a quick overview of this paper. You know, and it'd be great if you could start, Roger, with explaining kind of some of the opportunities AI presents in education and you know what its potential is to reduce inequality. Um, so yeah, over to you. Thanks very much, Rosie. And yes, I I'm, was, was very pleased when you, you asked me to do this because I do think the role of AI in education is central to what the CPP is trying to achieve. If we look at the barriers to fair growth, low educational attainment in more deprived communities, as your own work has shown, is absolutely foundational to these issues, as well as being a, a problem that affects productivity and, and, and economic stagnation across the economy as a whole. So this is, this is crucial. Going back to 97 and Tony Blair on education, 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 the, the belief that education is our route to solving these problems has remained very consistent. Our ability to actually make it happen has never lived up to the expectations. We're now once again experiencing a moment of hope because AI has arrived and particularly generative AI and there is a recognition that this could be genuinely transformative. Now, some of us will have seen this before and, you know, remember in the early days of the internet when people thought that maybe if you could put all the knowledge of the world into every home, we wouldn't need schools anymore and everybody could uh, be as educated as anyone else. That didn't happen. So we need to be cautious about not overclaiming here. But the early indications about what is possible are extremely encouraging. So I think we should take this very seriously. Um, the paper makes two points, actually. It says that we, we should be encouraging the adoption of AI personal tutoring products. And it also suggests that the government should be using AI to inform its uh, career support services. But I'm, I'm just going to focus on the, on the first of those two things initially. And, just to, and I want to sort of set out why I think the government needs to step up here and has a more active role to play. So AI personalised tutoring products, they're not new, they have been around for a while. The evidence that they work is actually pretty, it's pretty strong. I mean, it's, 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 there's a decent amount of evidence these things improve your educational outcome. So you might ask, why has the penetration been so low? Why are they not now used generally through, throughout schools? And part of the reason is to do with the, the quality of the evidence. 
It is highly variable. It's often uh, um, based on lab conditions. There's a lot of uncertainty about how to best use these systems in the classroom. Uh, so that if you're a school or a college and you're thinking about it, it is simply not an obvious thing to do to say, OK, we're going to go and adopt one of these things because you don't know how necessarily how you're going to fit it into the how you work today. And you, it's not clear from the evidence that it's necessarily going to deliver the improvements that you would like it to. Certainly getting a level of evidence about a specific product is, uh, is extremely difficult to do. So that's one problem we've got. It's, it's, it's very hard to know what to buy or what to use and how to adopt it. The second problem we have is, is actually quite the opposite, which is, which is the alternative concern, which is to say, were, it, were we successfully to, uh, to introduce and adopt this technology at scale and it, were proved, and it proved to be uh, helpful, we then have a very different problem, which is, yeah, but what are, going, what are the negative consequences of this? What are the potential downsides? And, and top of the list there is that it, would, it could potentially widen attainment gaps. Indeed, it seems most likely that were you simply to allow this technology, were it to, were it to become very clear that this is the thing that schools should buy, it is the most likely outcome without any further intervention is that it would widen attainment gaps because both the, uh, the uptake would occur amongst in wealthier areas, the private provision would be higher uh, uh, amongst wealthier families. And there's very strong evidence that the actual use of these technologies is, is most effective amongst people who are already doing, uh, do, being most successful in education. So simply powering that with, with, with enhancing that whole pattern with, with stronger technology would likely increase attainment gaps, which would add to the issues of fair growth that CPP has long worked on. The paper sets out, in, in view of this, uh, the suggestion that the government needs to have a much stronger role here. And, and the role I'm suggesting is one of enabling a deep understanding of the impact of these technologies. I'm not actually even suggesting the government necessarily takes the lead in doing the work of deciding what impact is. I think that, you know, that's a role often for academics and other bodies. But, but what is important is that we have the capability to do that. We have the capability to understand when these systems are working, the conditions under which they work and their impact on educational attainment gaps. Not least because if, if the market, if the uptake in the market is primarily amongst students that are doing well at school, the market will produce products that best serve those students. And if we want these products to be, have most impact on those students who struggle at school, we're going to need to be able to direct money and resources and investment and encourage the market to address those needs. What does that mean? Primarily, I think the steps are firstly that the contracting between schools, colleges and providers of these systems needs to be done in a way that is managed at a national level. We need to do it in such a way that the data that these things generate, which is colossal and extremely uh, personal about students when a student interacts with the system, that we have a clear understanding of how that data is going to be held by the organisations providing these tools, the way in which privacy is protected, we have crystal clear clarity on the rights of any provider to use that data for their own purposes in improving their products. And the education system as a whole has very clear rights to be able to use that data to understand the impact of these technologies. Now that last point brings in another set of considerations because it's no good just simply having the right to do that, you then also have to have the capability. And that is something that right now we do not have within the education system. This would be a, a significant uh, change in the way we understand and, and manage education. But we're at a point now where I think we need to be moving into that world anyway. We need to be thinking much more about how more timely, actionable, real world evidence flows through our thinking in terms of policy in order to better address people's needs. And I think this technology provides the opportunity to do that. So the proposal is that government should absolutely encourage the adoption of these, but it needs to set down the terms on which schools and colleges can buy them. It needs to support schools and colleges in making decisions about how to use them. And it needs to be able to monitor the impact and the success of these systems in supporting students to achieve better educational outcomes. N not least because in time, our understanding of what a good educational outcome will change because of these technologies, in, in, in my view. So, so that is the proposal, and I think this is a, it would be a change in the way government operates. It would be require them to, to, to adopt some new ways of working, new ways of thinking. But I think we, we need to do this now, but both because it will encourage uptake if we do it now and, and can ensure that uptake is beneficial. 
And if we don't do it, and then and it really does take off in a major way, we're going to find ourselves very much on the back foot extremely quickly. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Yeah, I think yeah, they're such interesting questions, aren't they? So how you know how can we prevent education attainment gaps widening without kind of trying to put the brakes on progress, which which sort of feels like the most likely knee jerk response. And then how can we increase that capability in the public sector to kind of make a success of national contracting data protection? Yeah, big, big questions. I'm going to come to you first, Rose. Um, you're a professor who specialises in AI and education. And, you know, Roger sort of set out some of the case for using AI in education, um, you know, but that are the institutions are quite a long way behind the technology at the moment. So, you know, how do you think that AI tools can best be adopted through the school education system? Thanks, Rosie. Yeah, I think Roger laid it out really clearly. There is good evidence collected over decades that well-designed AI systems that are carefully implemented can be very effective. They can even be very effective for actually bridging some of those gaps in achievements, but they have to be designed explicitly and implemented in a very careful way in order for that to be achieved. And I agree that Roger raises a really important point about the risks that actually will end up increasing the divide. So we need to do this very carefully. I think it's worth looking at other countries who have done this or are doing this. Of course, we are not the same as these other countries and the context is important, but we can learn from that. So if you take a country like Singapore, in 2019, they brought in their national AI strategy, personalized education through adaptive learning and assessment. And since that time, they have been designing and rolling out three AI use cases, one for an adaptive learning system, one for a learning feedback assistant and one for a learning companion system. They're still in the process of rolling them out. And that's part of my point. 2019, we're now 2024. It takes time. The other important thing about the approach they're adopting is all of those three AI use cases sit within an existing national platform. We don't have that. This is not a reason to say we can't do it. I think we can. I'm just highlighting that we can learn from countries who've trodden the ground first about some of the challenges. And they are still looking to roll out those use cases. So, and that's in a much smaller country and a country where it's much easier to have a more kind of top down approach and the infrastructure is very consistent. So we don't have the consistent infrastructure. There's huge disparities in the kind of hardware and connectivity that exists in different parts of the country, different schools, so huge challenges. And I'm not trying to be the kind of negative ninny here and say, you know, it's too difficult, we shouldn't do it. But I think we must go into it with our eyes open and, and realise that we have to do it carefully, thoughtfully. And there is absolutely a key role for government here, because this could be a wonderful moment for actually helping students who are struggling by giving them some support and their teachers some support from powerful technologies that can support their learning, but can also support teachers with better information about individual students' learning processes. It's interesting that in the Singapore example, yes, they're concerned about learning outcomes, but they're also concerned about the learning process and the teaching process. So it's all tied up together. I don't wanna take any more time because you've got wonderful other speakers to come in, but absolutely I'm on board. And I, I think the paper raises some really important points. We should be doing it, but we shouldn't, be shutting our eyes to the complex and difficult challenge that we're facing. And therefore, I think the real need for government to be very much behind this, if we're going to get this done successfully. Yeah, thanks, Rose. Um, yeah, interesting to hear about Singapore and the international comparisons. It doesn't, well, it's, it's a different topic, but if, if planning's anything to go by, I'll, we're, not, <laughs> we're not great at, you know, getting, getting things through the system in this country. And, the, and but... the other thing that's a real challenge, and Roger, you bring this out in the paper as well, and that is teacher capacity. Mm. You know, one of the things that we're seeing in Singapore is there's a huge need to make sure you get that professional development for the educators in place so that they know how to leverage this technology because all the data over the years about AI systems in education demonstrates that the way it's implemented is fundamental to the success. So you can have a well-designed system, 
that isn't well implemented and you won't leverage the benefit. So it's got to be well designed and well implemented. And in order to be well implemented, you need that teacher capability and capacity. Yeah. And um, yeah, and as we know, teachers teachers tend to be quite stretched. Um, I'd like to bring you in, uh, Kareke. You've you worked at Five Rights on their digital um futures commissions project. So, and I think, you know, we heard from Rose about the international side. What do you think UK schools and teachers need from policymakers to kind of to make AI work in practice? Well, um, the, in the Digital Futures Commission's blueprint for education data report, um, we argued for a standardised evaluation framework for edtech based on a holistic lens of children's rights. That could be also, you know, advanced into edtech certification to help schools identify effective and safe edtech to use. This would also, you know, the, the a holistic framework would also be able to detect and address issues about data accuracy and potential discriminatory outcomes. Um, so that, you know, when, when technologies are put in place, they don't end up exacerbating the, the, the differences and disparities and the inequalities that already exist. So my the other thing is my colleagues' review of the data governance framework applied in education settings and also our um, legal analysis of Google Workspace for Education's privacy policies and the technical um, investigation into Google Classroom argued for better regulatory enforcement and standard contracts with um, edtech providers to mitigate data protection risks. Now, we do have some examples of effective regulatory enforcement and government intervention that resulted in better privacy protection for children in education. And this example goes back to the case of the Dutch data protection authorities threatening to ban schools and universities from using Google Classroom. The result of that is that um, Google has committed to implementing um, technical changes, procedural changes, contractual changes that um, significantly improve the um, the data use and data protection and privacy protection for children while they are learning. So this makes it fairer um, for, for, for both businesses and children. So in that way, we could see more balanced ways of benefits from data collected as part of um, children learning being used. Thanks, that's, yeah, really interesting. And a reminder, I suppose, that in, when it can seem like particularly big tech companies like Google have a lot of the the power here, I think that's a good reminder to policymakers, you know, government and regulators with the Dutch example that, that, you know, they do have a lot of the power and that you can kind of over tech companies to get them to provide the service that you want because you're, you're the purchaser of that service. I think that's quite a good thing to... So also the important thing about this is that, I mean, this may well have happened in the Netherlands, but the UK yeah. um, children also benefit from it. Our um, okay. follow-up investigation found that um, the same sort of technical changes and um, privacy controls also applied mm -hmm. to the services available to children in schools in the UK. Yeah, no, that's, and yeah, that's really interesting. And I guess that, that shows as well just how how it can raise the bar across across countries as well um thank you um will um you're a kind of former teacher and head teacher and so i'd be interested to get your take on you know the potential of ai tools in the classroom for te like but what's their benefit for teachers how can we make sure that they're working for for teachers and schools as, as well as for students yeah absolutely and i really, really um struck me what you said, Rose, about the implementation piece and whatever policy framework exists has to really take account of actually what happens in the classroom and those behaviours that um, flow from the teachers and the learners and how they're affected by whatever policy framework there is. Um, in Roger's report, he mentions a, a phrase that, that stood out for me, the greatest potential lies in systems that support teacher and pupil interactions. And I guess... Um, what I'm interested in is how does the teacher actually use the tools? How does it actually improve um, what we know makes good teaching and learning rather than necessarily fundamentally change it in a way that might be a kind of unwanted mutation? And I think to the, um, the user cases of, of um, AI in education already, it's 
quite extensively used in lots of different areas, um, um, particularly for that personalization of practice. So machine learning um, algorithms used to spot patterns in, in student behavior and to really find where gaps in learning are and to personalize questions that can then address those gaps. And you can see already how that's an incredibly useful time-saving um, tool for teachers um, because good teaching and learning is about being responsive and understanding where pupils are at and giving them what they need to move forward in their learning. Um, so I suppose um, the key thing is how does that information then flow to the teacher and how can it be best used by the teacher um, to move learning on? And, and I guess um, the, the best examples of that are where data insights that flow from from people's answering questions and developing, you know, showing skills and, and misconceptions then gets directly fed into um, a recommendation for a next step. And there are examples of, of platforms where teachers can literally click a button, there's some homework that the kids have done, and it produces a set of questions that are their starter. And that's fantastic responsive teaching, and, and it, it, you can see how that really impacts. Um, I guess the flip side of that is, is, is the whole risk to personalization. And I was listening to the radio this morning, and. Um, Justin Harris from the Centre of Humane Technology is on there, and he was talking about the risk that like pure personalization breaks a sense of shared reality. And I think the um, space of the classroom is the prime example of that shared reality that a pupil and a teacher occupies. And if everybody's just squirreled away doing their own thing on their own pathways, they're not accessing those um, important um, shared experiences. Um, they're not experiencing the, the benefits of, of the teacher interaction. Um, we know when we speak to teachers that, that whilst they hate marking, for example, um, that's often the time where they feel closest to their students and they enjoy reading what students have written. They just don't like doing it, you know, at 10 o'clock at night when they're meant to be seeing their kids. So I guess the potential of AI in education and, and the role of publishers like OUP is to try and work out how best to, I guess, supercharge those really important roles of the teacher. For looking at things like marking, going, can we do some of the heavy lifting, but can we allow you to do the, the bits that we know you're expert in, which is what makes a teacher a teacher, which is about responding to that voice, creating those shared experiences. Um, and, and I think that can be done in, with the right tools. Um, my last point really is, is Roger's report talks about like being able to experiment and, and and try those things out. And I think creating spaces for that is, is really exciting, but also important. Um, and when it comes to generative AI, having access to um, data sets that are safe and that are not gonna produce unwanted um, uh, mutations, can't remember what the phrase is, but th things that you know display the worst in our collective knowledge base rather than the best. And again, that's where, you know, organizations like AUP, for example, have a great corpus information that we can cr use to create those safe um, spaces for developing products that can really add value to the classroom. Can I just quickly, um, it'd be good to get some other people's reflections on some of that, but just can I come back to you, Will, about you know, what's your experience in terms of, um, you know, seeing how these tools are, are taken up by and impact pupils learning can you you know and, and that impact on that attainment yeah. gap have you have you seen it kind of benefit um pupils who maybe weren't performing so well before or enjoying school so much or does you know it has you in your experience has it tended to be kind of better performing than pupils who are who are kind of more engaged with those sort of tools Anyway. Do you know what? I think that's a really good point. I think that that risk, which is highlighted, which is, you know, the, the, the things that work best for learners are always taken up by those who have access to knowing about what those are and have the time and space to think about them and innovate. And that might typically be in, in more affluent types of schools. Um, I would say that there's some amazing work being done by multi-academy trusts that deliberately work in disadvantaged areas. They work with schools in tough areas. Now, I remember that I was part of a, a trust during COVID. We gave every kid a Chromebook um, because that was the right thing to do. And that's what you know needed to happen in that space. Um, it's not uniform. So I think that idea of a kind of mandated structure of advice that comes from somewhere, it would be really, really great as well. Um, but certainly um, there are great examples of 
where it's used in those type of contexts, um, particularly like post-COVID where this whole idea of gap filling became a thing in education. You know, you've got to fill the gaps um, to move kids on because they've missed you know, X number of, of months and using platforms that very quickly identify what those gaps are, serve up practice that addresses what those are, can be really powerful. Um, I always used to think when I was in the classroom, it was like every second is precious. You know, when they're, um, I don't know, they got a gap in learning in the afternoon, you could fill it with a bit of vocabulary practice. And there's a great platform that does that driven by AI. Um, and it just basically supports vocabulary building. But like homework is a good example because that's a space that is traditionally like badly set by teachers. It's the last thing on your to-do list to do. You just do it because you kind of think kids have got to have homework, but actually there's a role to play for really good personalized platforms where kids can go home or go to their tutor space in school, after school, and they can practice what they've done in the classroom. But the key thing is what, what happens to that information? It doesn't just sit with the learner and exist independent of stuff. It goes back into the classroom, it gets fed to the teacher, it informs the next steps. So their teacher can really... Um, kick on in that lesson and know exactly what those pupils need from them um, to develop that positive, um, productive time that they have with the teacher. Um, so I definitely think there are good examples where it can um, impact. Um, I don't know if there's a point we're going to yeah. come to later, I've spoken for ages, but like yeah. the idea of like often in, often in schools that are in areas of disadvantage, they have problems with teacher recruitment. I know that's a problem for everyone. There was a report today from NFER, maths teachers in particular, 63% um, mm. targets been missed. And I can definitely see that there's a role for really good personalized platforms that, you know, for example, a supply teacher could use. My caveat yeah. there is that I wouldn't want that to become a kind of business model for schools in areas where they literally can't find a teacher. So they start thinking, well, we just need an LSA to sit with the kids, put them on this platform, that probably would get them to a decent level, but is that really the same as having a data-informed um, teacher that's really using those tools like a superpower to make the learning as good as it can be? It's not. And I would say whatever policy there needs to be needs to develop that approach rather than the risk, which is that AI can be a bit of a shortcut. Yeah. No, I think that's an interesting, that's definitely an interesting point. And I think it kind of feeds into some of that fear doesn't it about the the kind of vision the, the dystopian visions of the future that might exist but but that kind of plays against rose's earlier point that actually implementing all of this stuff takes lo loads of time and it even well, and, and, and those things always impact the, the most disadvantaged communities the most because they yeah. have the worst teachers they can't get recruitment their schools are in a category most likely to be in those disadvantaged areas it's like a knock-on effect so i'd like to, go on roger i was going to say i think in this context i'm um, going back to what rose said initially which is this takes time she's absolutely right but that, that is also to some degree a, a good thing in the sense that we yes. need to put in now as it were the contractual arrangements the data arrangements to make it possible for us to manage it so that's the first thing and then i think as krukai says we need some sort of evaluation framework to decide whether it's reasonable for a school to take something up and, and, and trial it and then after that i think the, the crucial thing there's a lot of talk about things like um, people talk about you know, sort of clinical trials as being a sort of model for what, how we might decide what to use in education. I think the difficulty with that is that this thing has moved far too fast for that. And we need to understand in, in much more uh, timely and actual way how, how they're operating. And that's where we get into what, a, what evaluation of actual use in real classrooms looks like and how we build that. But we are going to need a bit of time. I mean, it's not it, that's a difficult thing to build. And it's going to take us a bit of time to work it out. So the fact that this will as it were, we, we, we can't do a big top down thing in the UK, it's just we just don't work that way. So we're going to need to work with the, with, the, with, with the companies and the schools that are willing to move forward now, but do it in a way that will support our long term objectives. Yeah, definitely. But I'd like to just quickly bring the discussion back to kind of the lifelong learning um, part of the paper. And Ross, you're, you're leading some research here at CPP centred really around industrial strategy industrial transitions how do you think that the opportunities around ai in an educational setting kind of ties into the wider digital transformation in jobs and skills that the government you know needs to be thinking about 
Yeah, thanks, Rosie. I think it's it's an interesting question because, you know, over recent decades, we've seen a, a rapid digitalization of the economy, including the vast majority of jobs that people do. You know, basic computer skills are now a, a prerequisite for most jobs, um, but also our transition into a more digital world has created countless new jobs that we could barely have imagined ever existing in the past. So a longer view of history sort of points to a consistent trend of technological disruption, reshaping the nature of industry and also work itself. And probably seems that AI, you know, that is the disruptor of our time. Um, particularly, so, you know, sort of this early stage of the 21st century. I think it's too early to say with any certainty what exactly the impact of AI in the job market will look like over short, medium to long terms. But we can probably assume its main effects are twofold. One will be on augmentation of existing jobs. So AI changes the nature of individual jobs, the skills people need and the tasks that they carry out. And then the other Like is teaching. just total dis like teaching, exactly. The other is just total displacement of jobs that make AI irrelevant. And that's 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 quite big, um, really. But both of them present different policy challenges, you know, on augmentation. Challenge really is how you raise AI and digital literacy broadly across your current and future workforce. Um, on lifelong learning and thinking about current workers, I think that's quite difficult. You know, I think there's one thing that's particularly challenging, and that's thinking about Britain, and that is relative to a lot of other countries. We just don't have that sort of major culture of lifelong learning and adult education. So trying to foster that, I think, is one thing. The policy question that sits beneath that really is how you actually do that in practice and to start thinking about that. What you need to do is look at our current context and what those barriers are. The fact is that we're going to need employers and we're going to need in government to invest in skills development so that people have that technological technical knowledge and the confidence to keep up as jobs continue to evolve. Um, we know already, this is the problem really, that businesses and government underinvest in skills development and there's a growing body of evidence suggesting businesses, in particular relative to where we've been, don't. And particularly since 2010, and when we think about adult education, we've seen budgets cut significantly and we're quite a lot, quite a lot of the way, well, We're quite below where we used to be. So I think getting back to that um, is one thing. CPP have done a lot of work on this in the past, and we have a lot of ideas out there specifically on what we might ought to do to be getting there and fostering that culture of lifelong learning. Um, we've got more to come this year. But briefly, I think what we need to look at really is the incentives that we give to business to invest in skills. That's one thing. The second thing that I think is important is how you sort of widen access to participation in the formal, formal skill system. thinking particularly about making what is currently a very rigid system quite flexible. And, you know, on that second point, I think there's a lot to be said about Roger's thoughts in his report on micro-credentialing. In general, I think a focus on more modular courses that are flexible is some, is, you know, that's one of the key levers that we've got that we'll need to, you know, put in place to be responsive to change. Um, there's a slightly different point about how businesses and skills providers use AI themselves to personalise training and improve standards. Um, I think that's something the government should be looking at. But I suppose, just to close up quickly, the prize is that if we can do this and develop that culture and have AI at the centre of it, then Britain and its people will be wealthier. As a result, AI will be able potentially to make us more productive and that will help raise our living standards. And we'll have a more adaptive workforce That will enable people to create opportunity for themselves in new and emerging occupations and for Britain as a you know a national economy to create opportunity in new and emerging industries. But I do stress again, just to finish up, that sort of point on access to opportunity. And we have to think hard and be quite specific about how we might reform our skill system and the incentive we give to businesses so that upskilling and retraining opportunities are available to a broader range of people as we can. And if I was a government, I'd be thinking quite hard about that because the gains are there to be made, but the distribution of those gains depends a lot on access. And, and if you can't tackle that issue of access, then those gains will be concentrated on only a small number of people. And it ends up being the case potentially that, you know, what you get is good jobs and good living standards and improvements there for a lot of people and insecurity and instability for others. So if you're thinking about AI, lifelong learning, industrial strategy, I think that's that's it really. Focus on access and how those three sections link together. And I think there there's a lot to a lot that we can do. And there's a big prize. Yeah, no, definitely something that something we want the next government to be thinking about for sure. Um, before we go to audience questions, it'd be good to just come back to you, Roger, quickly on um, on this kind of lifelong learning point and how AI can be used to personalise um, and integrate adult skill services. Is there anything you kind of wanted to comment on that? Because that's that's a section of the paper as well. Yeah, no, I think I think Ross covered it. I mean, the, the points I particularly make is that is that the Now, if you're if you're a non-graduate stream, and if you're in, particularly if you're in the lowest attaining thirty percent of the population, 
it's, it's not just that your, your opportunities are more limited, it's also that navigating those opportunities is incredibly difficult. And there's a huge amount that can be done to support that. Um, I think the, the point about modularization, I think is right. We've always seen it as a problem because it can lower standards, but that has only been a problem because of the limitations of the reporting of qualifications. Given that everything is now being, you know, most recruitment is happening through data-driven systems now, that limitation should not be a limitation at all. We should be able to modularize things and report them in sufficient detail that people can make sense of what, what the skills uh, that people have. What employers say most often is they find it very difficult to actually work out from the information people have after 20 years of education whether they could actually be any good at the job. And that is, that's something we could, we could try and fix. Yeah, thanks, Roger. All right, let, let's get into a couple of audience questions because we've had some good questions come in. Um, and maybe um, speakers, put, you put your hand up virtually or not virtually, however you'd like, and I'll come to you. So um, given that both political parties are playing down the ability of government to increase funding to any area, how likely do the panel think it is that national AI infrastructure will transpire? And if unlikely, what the next best policy options? So a bit of a national policy question. Who would like to take that one? If we go first. Maybe I'll come to you, Rose <laughs> or Roger. Yeah. Let's get to Rose first then, Roger. Thanks. It's a really good question <laughs> and it's a really interesting question. So there are different ways of looking at it. There definitely are some cost savings to be had through the use of AI. It's not necessarily obvious, and we need clear evidence about how best you achieve those cost savings. But I do think there are ways that we can use AI to, particularly in back office and processing and admin work, we can do that. So that can help save costs that might be redirected, but it is gonna be, it, it, it's not gonna happen that quickly. And I worry that it won't be enough to do what needs to be done. I did write a paper a couple of years ago, actually, um, for the Labour Party, as it, as it happens, um, on what you might do about AI. So this was the, before the launch of ChatGPT. And I still think there's something in this. I was suggesting that actually, and it might not be one or the other, but perhaps thinking about more local um, initiatives where you look at community groups, you look at bringing cross multi-stakeholders together in the local community, perhaps around the hub of a school or a university where you can get, because there's a lack of expertise as well as a lack of the actual infrastructure. If you think about the technology, there's the skills infrastructure as well. So thinking about having that community-based approach, because then you get the advantage of, for each particular region, the local knowledge about the challenges in that area are there they're not being swooped in. It's kind of the opposite to the Singapore approach, if you like, because we're not Singapore, as, as Roger points out. We can't do the drop-down thing. So thinking about how you, you enable those groups to be formed and how you bring those groups together, I think could be a way that you might start to build the kind of knowledge infrastructure. And maybe at the same time, you're looking to see what you can do in terms of you know, the technology infrastructure and the data infrastructure, because obviously we need to get that in place. And I think one of the toughest questions is going to be, what are the right relationships for the government to have with tech companies? You know, I have some real concerns about the situation we're in at the moment, because all routes lead back to the mangs. It's all Microsoft, Amazon, Nvidia, Google. Every road rings, but they're either investing in small companies, they're buying small companies, they own the models that small companies are using. The whole thing is very, very, you know, closed. And we really need to, to break that. But at the same time, being realistic, we can't, and it's not sensible to, to reinvent the wheel all the time, to necessarily start to have a government initiative to, new, to build a whole new technology infrastructure, a whole new large language model or whatever. So I think one of the big challenges is gonna be brokering the right relationships with the right technology partners that enable that infrastructure to be built. So sorry, I've given you a kind of a little bit of a, 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 a smorgasbord of answers there, <laughs> Rosie. You know, I think definitely there's some local initiatives that could be done. And one of the key challenges is working out what the right relationships are for government, for education to have with technology companies so that we can all get the best. And I thought the point that Kraku made about the Google relationship being improved because of the way that the Dutch stood their ground, I think there's also a lot of that standing our ground that needs to happen here. Thank you. 
Yeah, agreed. Roger, did you want to come in quickly on the, off the back of that? Yeah, yeah, just a couple of points. Firstly, to say, getting the contractual relationship right and the and the and the who how the data is held by the companies and who what they're allowed to do with it and what um, uh, education the education system is allowed to do with it that doesn't cost very much money. We just and as, as Roger says, we need to stand our ground and it has to be a we're not doing this without getting this right now. So that seems to be that's that that seems to be pretty straightforward. On this point about the, the the relationship with the big companies, I think there's an interesting thing here because while I absolutely uh, 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 am sympathetic to what Rose is saying about the, the concerns about the power of these organisations, there is a moment right now where they are keen, as it were, to establish, particularly Microsoft, very interested in establishing its ability to deploy um, its its uh, investment in open AI into the education system safely. So I think there's there's actually a moment there to, that, that we, we can involve working with them. And again, if you have the contractual relationships right with how companies hold data, the fact there's a r- relatively small number of them that you might be working with is actually could potentially potentially beneficial. Um, that, that all goes to the cost of actually paying for these, these systems. The other thing just to say about it, I do think, and I'm you know, slightly cheeky in the, in, in the report, but made the point that, you know, we spend some money at the moment collecting data that is supposed to enable us to understand our education system and inform decisions about it, which simply lacks anything like the level of precision or accuracy or reliability that it, it would warrant giving it the, 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 the weight it's given. And we should just stop doing that stuff and recognise we, we need to start thinking a, a, a bit about where we're going, not, not where we were 50 years ago. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Roger. All right, the next question um, is going to be for Kareki. Um, What are your views regarding the concurrent need to enhance educator skills in incorporating AI into our work and the legal implications of doing so? I suppose I'll address perhaps the latter part of the question. Yeah, that's if fine. you free up teachers' time and worries and concerns about the legal implications, then they could focus more, they have more time to focus on you know, how it, getting their heads around what technology works, how AI works, and how they could incorporate AI effectively into the teaching and learning that would improve um, learners, um, uh, students' learning experiences. So how do we do that? And go back then to um, evaluation framework, because at the moment, schools are overwhelmed with choices, and they struggle to navigate those choices and make informed decisions about them. So the, the the best step, uh, perhaps the first thing that needs to happen is, you know, an easily accessible way for schools to recognize what works, what doesn't yet work, and what is legally compliant. And then regulatory enforcement that shifts the responsibilities to the companies, incentivizing them to innovate responsibly so that teachers can focus on the learning part and integrating the technologies into the classroom. And then one another point is the um, Roger mentioned about the um, the standard contractual frameworks um, that 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 would also save schools some headaches. Um, knowing that schools are um, constrained by, you know, uh, have got legal and technical resource constraints. So these things would help alleviate that problem. Thank you. Sorry, it's on mute there. Does anyone else want to come in on, on that or shall I move on to the next question? I can make a really, really swift point. I um, yeah. totally agree with what you just said, um, Berke. In terms of what teachers want and need, you know, they're in the business to make an impact on children's lives. I believe that in the vast majority of teachers I work with. And so they want things that work. They want to see impact. They don't want to have to spend all of their you know, 60 hour weeks doing stuff that doesn't work. So anything that helps a teacher to understand the impact of what they're doing is to be um, encouraged. EF is incredible in, in terms of doing that. Government funded um, collates research and, and gives really quick, easy to understand toolkits of what works and, and advice of how to implement it. So something that incorporated AI into that framework would be really helpful. Thank you. I'm going to try and squeeze in one final question, I think, and then it'll be time for us to go. Um, so this question is, what steps can we take immediately to kind of connect up different parts of the system to quickly deliver kind of and it's a big question, really. Quickly deliver the value of AI in a safe and a- appropriate way. But basically, you know, what are the practical next steps? Do we think? Does anyone want to want to take? What would you do first? Anyone on the panel <laughs> want to take that one? Actually, I'm just going to say very quickly what I would do first, and it, and it would eventually help with joining up. 
is actually helping teachers understand enough about AI so that they can feel confident that they understand how to mitigate the risks and use it beneficially. I feel that's a huge need at the moment, that capacity building is something and something we could get started on now is that, you know, we could do this and that would really help. But I'll give other people a chance as well. Does anyone else want to come in with a final final point before we before we close up? <laughs> I say something very quickly and quite simply, just to bring it back to sort of government again. But you know, there was there's likely to be an election this year. I know that you know the Labour Party have spoken in particular a lot about mission driven government and a big shake up of Whitehall and institutions all across the country and that sort of thing. It potentially, you know, if you want to be sort of serious about embedding AI into public services, things like schools and other parts of the public realm as well, alongside a big shake up of the system, if you like, then there's a big opportunity I think in looking at where the connections can be made and bringing the potential of AI as a means of reforming public services and re improving outcomes into the, the sort of centre of government and that part of that mission-driven approach. So, you know, the, the, there could be detail and how you work that out, but I think it's sort of a guiding principle. I think there's potentially a lot you can do there to bring it into the centre of government in particular. Thanks, Russ. Oh, All right, go on. Sorry. On Sorry no, uh, I was just going to say, reflecting on quite a few of the comments we made, there's, there's a, I don't know, is it an irony that... Um, We've been talking a lot about what does government do? What can there be centrally to do? What AI and the nature of AI education is all about personalization and learner driven. Decentralization, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and actually, really, what Rose said earlier about like listening to the end user, listening to communities, actually hear what their problems are. I think that is a really key part of the process, listening to those key stakeholders, those mats, those um, you know, in those areas that are doing great work. What do they need? and know, work up out from that as much as we are thinking about what are the more macro level things that need to be put in place, which are also important. Yeah, thanks, Will. Um, okay, so we're running slightly over time. So I think I think we're gonna we're gonna call it and say that's all we've got time for. But um anyone watching, please do you know continue the conversation on social media. Um, we'll share a recording of this event and a massive thank you to all of our speakers, Roger, Rose, Will, Karaki and Ross. <laughs> Thanks to everyone for joining online. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in CPP's work, sign up for our newsletter and keep an eye out for our next webinar on green and digital transitions. Thanks everybody, have a good day. <laughs>